the life of Jesus was and will always be countercultural. The good news of the gospel, even when powerfully modeled and proclaimed, got John the Baptist, the Apostle Paul, Jesus, and the prophets all killed. Many will never understand why our Christian lives and views, informed by the gospel, are so different from everything else they see and experience around them. But often, it seems, we're not ridiculed or rejected because we're living such radically loving and selfless lives. It's because we actually live so little like Jesus. Let's be the same people everywhere we are and with everything we say. Let's stop the hypocrisy of having different personas or weird levels of engagement in different arenas of life. All of the one another's found in scripture, like love one another, bear with one another, encourage one another, do not judge one another, etc. All of those one another's found in the New Testament apply whether at your dinner table, on social media, or at a neighborhood barbecue. Be sure your words build up rather than tear others down. Welcome to the Everyday Disciple Podcast, where you'll learn how to live with greater intentionality and an integrated faith that naturally fits into every area of life. In other words, discipleship as a lifestyle. This is the stuff your parents, pastors, and seminary professors probably forgot to tell you. And now, here's your host, Cesar Kalinowski. All right, good to be back. And you know what else is good? Summer is back here for us. Yeah, we got a cold week or so for a while there. And I thought, well, that was it. It went from heat warnings to like super fall and now we're back to summer and when the weather is nice in the pacific northwest it's the nicest place i've ever been anywhere it really is people who have lived here or live here know that to be true when the when the weather's nice here it's so nice because there's yeah it's perfect thank you anyway loving it looking forward to though probably going to be getting colder here soon and the true fall is probably going to set in hey let me uh, read a few reviews that came in a while back i think i may have missed i love it when you leave reviews these both came in through apple however you can leave reviews on whatever system you listen to podcasts in if they support that here's one from b harsey that says experiencing life to the fullest five stars thank you he says if you are on the journey of living life to the fullest, this podcast addresses practical issues that if you'll implement in your community, home, family, and heart, you'll be transformed. A few little changes in perspective, the way you see things over time will make an incredible difference. Learn to walk by faith, not by religion, and experience the life that we get to live with God. Love that. So good. And here's another five star that came in from W. Reichert. Let it be. He says, my wife and I have been truly trying to live a kingdom lifestyle, and although we are having a very tough time finding others willing to join us, you're not alone in that, this podcast gives us hope and encouragement to keep searching for other people of peace. Thanks for this teaching and its importance week after week. You are so welcome. Thanks for leaving the reviews and the stars. That helps other people who are looking for podcasts understand what this is about and encourages them as well. I hope that you have subscribed to whatever system you're on. Subscribe so you don't miss an episode. They come out new every Monday. And I can send you to a little page that gives you all kinds of places you can hear podcasts. In case you're maybe listening on the website or whatever, you can go to everydaydisciple.com forward slash subscribe and you'll see all the various platforms that are out there. Well, there's a million, but you'll see the biggest ones, probably the ones you'd be most interested in. Before I dive into our topic today, I do want to again extend an invitation to hop on a Zoom call, just us, get to know each other a little bit, and tell you a little bit more about the coaching that we offer. We're coming up to a time of the year where we're going to have a new cohort starting, and if you'd be interested in learning a full framework for discipleship, missional living, helping others do the same, growing in your gospel fluency, I'd love to get on a call with you and tell you a little bit more about it and see if that's a good fit for you. You can get a little bit more information and fill out a little small little form to let me know that you'd like to set up a call. And you can go to everydaydisciple.com forward slash coaching to find out all the stuff about it. All right. Recently, I read an article by Kerry Newhoff, and he's a pastor, writes a lot of great stuff that kind of tweaks my head at times, very articulate, and I was moved by it. And I wanted to use his thoughts 
and outline as a springboard to talk about some of these same things. Five dumb things that Christians, we all need to stop doing because they really affect our witness, our discipleship. And I want to also talk about a little bit of the gospel behind all of it, the thing behind the thing with each of these issues. So here we go. Thanks again to Kerry Newhoff for these some of these ideas. I'm even going to quote him in spots. Here's the first one of all the five dumb things we need to stop doing. Stop being so absurd online. Too many Christians come across online as either haters, cynical, or just too darn syrupy. You know, they're haters. They're the angry ranters. There's trolls. There's the theology police out there that have to try to correct everybody in everything. They're arguing with anyone who doesn't agree with them or you don't agree with what that person said, yeah, don't come off like a hater. That, why are you doing that? Stop. Let's stop that. Or cynical, yeah, I know everybody's disappointed with everything all the time. No one gets it as right as you do. <laughs> oh, ick. Or the syrupy Christians online. It's Everything so sweet. It's like you live inside a Christian Hallmark card or a Precious Moments display. Yeah, I, ugh. No one needs more of that. Well, why do so many Christians think that their social media feeds are a place to show the world their unfiltered weirdness and strong opinions? Why is that? I bet it gives others online the impression that if they're going to follow Jesus, they're going to need to become socially awkward too. Yeah, Ugh, it's not helping. Here's the thing. If you think, well, people would just walk out of the room if I said that or brought things up like this in real life. Well, then maybe you shouldn't say it. I think that so many people get online and they get brave and they kind of hide behind that and maybe even have false profiles. If you do that, delete that now. That's just lying. That's just being weird. If you're angry or cynical or all you do is complain online and you think, well, I wouldn't want to be friends with someone like that in real life, then that's a clue that maybe you shouldn't say it or be like that. Well, what do you think? But I know some of you are thinking, yeah, but Jesus got mad. There is such a thing as righteous indignation. We got to stand up for some stuff. Okay, sure. Jesus did get angry at times. But what did Jesus get upset about? Oh, look, He got uh, upset about hardness of heart. You can look in Mark 3. Uh, selfish ambition in people, Mark 8. Spiritual arrogance among his own disciples, Luke 9. Self-centeredness, Matthew 23. Here's a biggie. This really upset Jesus was hypocrisy and fake religiosity. Mm -hmm. That's from Luke 11. See, try as you might, you won't find any passage where Jesus got mad at sinners for being sinners. You will, however, find him getting angry with so-called righteous or religious. And by the way, you won't find Jesus spouting off about Rome or the emperor. He simply reminded his followers that his kingdom is not of this world, which Leads us to number two, stop arguing about politics, either online or in general. Part of the general creepiness with a lot of Christians is political. Just think about this. God is not a Republican or a Democrat. He's not a conservative or a liberal. God is God. He always does what is good, right, and perfect. Be careful. Because when you or your church becomes a mouthpiece for a political party, I think you cease to be the church. Our job is to share the gospel, making disciples of Jesus, not to change the government. Here's what Kerry himself said about this. He says, having a government that doesn't embrace the church's value line for line actually puts Christians today in some great company, the company of the earliest followers of Jesus. Jesus spent about zero time asking the government to change during his ministry. In fact, people asked him to become the government, and he replied, like I just mentioned, this kingdom, his kingdom, is not of this world. And you know what else? He goes on, he says, the Apostle Paul appeared before government officials regularly. Not once did he ask them to change the laws of the land. Hmm. Food for thought, right? And I know some will say, well... God has opinions about things happening today. Mm -hmm. Yep, he does. But when authentic Christians sincerely share different views on subjects, we should be very careful about claiming to speak for God. 
We need to stop obsessing over being right and acting like we have all the answers. Remember, God is great, so I, we don't have to be in control. Let's start focusing a lot more on following Christ's example. Sacrificial living, helping everyone in need, comforting, loving everyone around us. But I'm afraid for Christians, it's often easier to yell and complain, oftentimes hidden away online, instead of doing the very hard and humble work of loving people. People are messy. And Jesus loved every one of them, including you and me. And I know arguing is sort of addictive because it feeds off of our need for self-glorification, self-righteousness, pride, recognition. Be careful about that. All right, here's number three. Stop handling conflict so poorly or avoiding conflict altogether. I think the church should be the best in the world at handling conflict. Jesus taught us exactly how to do it. Remember in Matthew 18, where he says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you've won that person back, back to relationship. But if you're unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. In other words, that way there's clarity of exactly what was said. And Jesus goes on and says, if the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Now, that doesn't mean to the church service. Who, who's the church? What's the church? To people, to the community that does life on life with that person. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, the body, the people, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. And by the way, how did Jesus treat pagans and corrupt tax collectors? With love with patience, with come and follow me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've taken and distorted this where Jesus made it real clear for us. Do your best to be careful. Go personally to that person. If that's not working, bring another couple of trusted friends that that person trusts and so do you. And if that doesn't work and the community can't convince them, then treat them with great love, with great patience, as if they're like an unbeliever. Yeah. I hope that's how we would treat unbelievers. And certainly it's how we get to treat each other within the family of God, within the church. But way too often we sidestep or we avoid conflict altogether, which the thing behind the thing there, that's self-love, which is sin. We won't speak the truth face to face with someone because, well, it's awkward for me and I don't like conflict. Or what if they're not happy with me? And see, my highest value is that I need to be loved and liked by everyone. So I won't go to them like Jesus suggests and say, hey, I think you sinned against me here. And this is how it hurt. So sometimes we just avoid it. Like, again, that's self-love. Or we won't talk to that person. We just gossip. We talk about other people rather than to people, which is also sinful and selfishness. Yeah. Or sometimes we'll run over people claiming to know the truth. We'll just hammer them. Like, like I was saying, when a lot of people do that online. Well, we also do it face to face. We just sort of explode on people because we claim to know the truth. And by the way, that truth will set you free. And there's not a relationship of trust. There's not enough invitation banked that we can actually approach something that needs to. And maybe if it's a little stickier or a little harder to address. That takes love. That takes time and patience. That takes a lot of prayer. But without this, if we handle conflict within the church so horribly, why would anyone want to join our family? Why would anybody want to be on this team? Who needs that type of relationship? We were all, all of us humans, all created to live in grace-based environments. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the church. That's the kingdom come. We are to be living as a little outpost of that kingdom. So let's try to do a better job at handling conflict and loving people well enough to do that. Now, number four of the five dumb things we want to stop doing here as Christians, kind of hurting our team, hurting our witness out there. Number four, stop selectively ranking sin. Christians often seem to be pretty good 
at focusing on the moral failings of others while mostly ignoring their own. Any sin that someone else is committing, in your eyes, but you're not committing, at least currently, you got to go after that, got to get after that. There are whole strains of Christianity. They think that's their goal. It's just sin management. Get after that. And everybody else, primarily. And while we're at it, we usually have a lot more grace for our own sins than we do with those people that we're going after their sin. Got to got to get after it. And oh, and this bugs me too. Often we act like the worst sin someone can commit is a sexual sin. And yeah, for sure, sexual sin can have very serious implications. But so does gossip and divisiveness and fighting sins that Christians routinely participate in but then sort of sweep under the carpet like it's normal. I would suggest that just as many churches have been ruined by gossip and divisiveness and fighting, quarreling, as have been affected by sexual sin. Probably way more. And certainly, we need to surrender our sexuality to Christ. But I'm also for submitting our propensity to gossip and divisiveness and our greed. Submit all that to Jesus in dealing with all of that. Seriously. Here's the thing. God has both forgiven and forgotten all of your sins and everyone else's. That's what scripture teaches, that your sins have been put as far away as the east is from the west. We get a beautiful picture of that in the whole tabernacle system with the two goats. One goat was sacrificed for the sins of the people. The second goat, all their sins were confessed, put on its head, and then that goat was led away never to be seen again. Jesus paid for your sins, every last one of them on the cross. And God, in his grace, in his mercy, has not only forgiven you and everyone else, but he has chosen not to remember them. It's like when he sees you or your neighbor or whoever, he's like, well, what sin? Well, what sins? He just sees Jesus. He doesn't see you as the person who used to fill in the blank, dot, 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 dot. But, you know, I forgave him of that. Or a former fill-in-the-blank. God just loves you as a dearly loved daughter or dearly loved son. Let's stop ranking other sins and then using that sin to divide us. We all need Jesus exactly to the same degree, which is fully. And that leads us to this next and last one that I'll talk about today. Number five, stop judging those outside the church. This one turns a lot of people away from Christians, from the church itself, capital C, globally. And unfortunately, Jesus, it turns people off of Jesus. Again, Kerry Newhoff states, it's actually strange to ask non-Christians to hold Christian values. Hmm, I can remember my son saying the same thing to me. He's an attorney and he's done a lot of federal law. He says, dad, it's not even something you should expect. Why would they? Kerry says, as the Barna Group's pointed out in a lot of different studies, a growing number of people are post-Christian. Yeah, that's true of us. The question Christians living in a post-Christian culture have to ask themselves then is this. Why would we expect non-Christians to behave like Christians? For instance, if you believe sex is a gift from God to be experienced between a man and a woman within marriage, why would you expect people who don't follow Jesus to embrace that in the same way you do? Why would we expect people who don't profess to be Christians to wait until marriage to have sex or live together or be faithful to one person for their entire life or clean up their language and aspects of their lifestyle that aren't in line with the Bible? Or why would we expect them to pass laws like the entire nation was Christian? Seriously, why? Most people today in this increasingly post-Christian culture are not pretending to be Christians. So why would they adopt our Christian values and morals? We in the modern church have largely ignored Paul's instructions in the New Testament to stop judging non-Christians. Even Jesus said he didn't come into the world to judge it, but to save it. 
I completely get the urge to judge my neighbors and even the world. Things bother me too. I understand that. I feel that angst at times. If only this or if only this group of people would understand this or stop doing that. But I have to refrain. I cannot put myself in the place of God in their lives. Our faith in Christ and his completed work on the cross demands that. Hey, Christians, the world has a judge, and it's not you. Remember, God has both judged and punished all human sin on the cross. It is finished. That's what Jesus said. It is finished. Do you believe that? So let's stop judging everyone, both inside and outside the church. Let's start loving them. Let God be God. All right, I know that some of that could be a little hard to hear, but maybe we need to hear it. I know with some of these, I certainly needed a little reminder. Maybe that's why that article from Carrie hit me so hard. Food for thought, for sure. Now, before we take off, I want to give you the big three takeaways from today's talk. If nothing else, you don't want to miss these. And in case you're out driving or you're on a walk or you're at the gym or whatever, you can get a printable PDF of this week's big three as a free download by going to everydaydisciple.com forward slash big three. Everydaydisciple.com forward slash big three. Now here are the big three for this week. First, the life of Jesus was and will always be countercultural. The good news of the gospel, even when powerfully modeled and proclaimed, got John the Baptist, the Apostle Paul, Jesus, and the prophets all killed. Many will never understand why our Christian lives and views informed by the gospel are so different from everything else they see and experience around them. But often, it seems, we're not ridiculed or rejected because we're living such radically loving and selfless lives. It's because we actually live so little like Jesus. Number two, we were created and live for the purpose of showing others what God is truly like, glorifying our God. Ask yourself, are your words, attitudes, and opinions in line with that? Remembering James 1, 19 to 20, it says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. It was true back then for Jesus' own disciples. It's still true for us today. And number three, let's be the same people everywhere we are and with everything we say. Let's stop the hypocrisy of having different personas or weird levels of engagement in different arenas of life. All of the one another's found in scripture, like love one another, bear with one another, encourage one another, do not judge one another, etc. All of those one another's found in the New Testament apply whether at your dinner table, on social media, or at a neighborhood barbecue. Be sure your words build up rather than tear others down. Okay, I hope that was encouraging. Hope that's helpful. Maybe it's a bit convicting. That's okay too. I'll leave you in the hands of the Holy Spirit. But time's up for today. I hope you'll join me next week. We're going to continue to look at how the gospel speaks into absolutely every area of our lives. See you soon. Thanks for joining us today. For more information on this show and to get loads of free discipleship resources, visit everydaydisciple.com. And remember, you really can live with the spiritual freedom and relational peace that Jesus promised every day. 